Hello everyone and welcome to another week of Sindal Baptist House Church. We are so glad that you could join with us this morning, if for the first or the hundredth time. Whether you're watching this with your family or housemates, by yourself or with some friends over Zoom, we are together in the presence of God and it is great to be together. I'm Ash and I'm one of the life group leaders here at Sindal. I've been loving joining with you all, albeit from afar over the last few weeks. We're continuing our series today called I Know This Much Is True, which started last week. Today, we've got our senior pastor, Chris Daines, preaching. But before we hear from Chris, we've got the opportunity to worship our great God together through song. Good morning. We want to welcome you to Sindal Church this morning and so grateful that you can join us. We're going to sing worship together, um, some fantastic songs. And I just want to reflect on a little story before we do. A couple of years ago, I was lying on the bed of one of my, um, in, in the bedroom of one of my kids alongside them and it was dark in the bedroom and it was dusk outside and we were just watching the colour and the lights in the sky and the child I was with turned to me and said, do you know mum, I just love being with you and today we get to come together wherever you are, whether you're alone at home or whether you're with people, we get to be together and be with Jesus and we can say to him, do you know what, God, we just love being with you. We thank you that you are with us, that we get to do life with you and thank you for your constant faithfulness through every season of our life. And so we would love it if you join with us now as we sing songs together and celebrate the faithfulness of God. Yeah. 
sing together. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship Him.
We'd love if you could let us know that you or your household have tuned into today's service. The easiest way you can do this is via our online connect link at me.sb.org.au. At this link, you can check in as well as sub subscribe to our e-news, which is the best way for you to keep up to date with what's going on at Sindel. E-news is the primary way we share stories and opportunities like our main missions appeal and other information which is most relevant to our community. So we'd love for you to subscribe today. So much has changed about the way we worship God together on a Sunday, but some things remain the same. We want to continue to honour you for your ongoing faithfulness and generosity each week as you contribute to the offering, especially in a season where there is a lot of financial strain on many. We know that giving to God in seasons of upheaval is not easy, but we believe it is incredibly powerful. If you would like to give, you can find all the information at sb.org.au forward slash give. Happy Mother's Day to all the mums. We want to recognise Mother's Day today by acknowledging the incredible influence and presence that so many women have in our lives. Specifically to all the mums out there, we want to thank you for all that you do and all that you are. We don't always recognise all the things that you do, but in this moment, we want to honour you for the seen and unseen ways in which you love, protect, serve, lead and disciple us all. We bless you and continue to pray for you. We're going to do that right now, so why don't you join with me as we pray. Father God, we thank you for mums. We thank you for the many different roles they play in our lives. We thank you for the mums who are our chauffeurs, the mums who are our best friends, the mums that teach us, the mums that wash our clothes, the mums that show us how to drive, the mums that cheer us on, the mums that have become grandmas and nanas, the mums that help us move house, the mums that inspire us to be our best selves. We are so grateful for all that our mums do and all that they are. We take the time to honour them and give thanks for all the wonderful mums that God has given us. We now also bring our own circumstances and thoughts to you now, God. Perhaps Mother's Day is a hard day for you. Perhaps you're feeling the effects of isolation deeply. Maybe you're struggling to find peace during this time. Or perhaps you've just received some really good news that you've been waiting on or experienced breakthrough in an area that you've been praying for. Whatever your situation and circumstances today, why don't you bring it all to the cross right now? Let's lay the worries, victories, fears, doubts and excitement at the foot of the cross and remember that our God delights in being with us even in the mess. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you are with us even when we are far apart. That we can come boldly to you, assured of our identity and freedom as children, loved and cherished by you. We ask for all that we've experienced this week, that in the midst of joy or pain, that you remind us just how loved we truly are. Give us peace and comfort in the midst of it all, God. God, we thank you for the message you've laid on Chris's heart to share with us today. May his words be your words, and may we leave this service more aware of who you have created and called us to be in this world. Amen. We've now got the chance to hear from our senior pastor, Chris Daines, in today's message. Over to you, Chris. Well, happy Mother's Day to all you mums out there. Seems that we used up all our good weather before we got here. The weather's been a nightmare to predict over the last few weeks. I was out paddling on my kayak the other day, trying to get a few kilometres in before the storms and rain set in. It was a beautiful and sunny day, well, for a little period of time. And on the horizon, storm clouds were brewing. I was two kilometres from finishing up and all of a sudden it went very dark and the wind came up. The storm was here. Those last two kilometres felt like an eternity on the water and I couldn't believe that the storm had come up so quickly and I couldn't wait to get my feet on dry ground. It was, just, it was with great relief that I pulled into shore and hopped out of the kayak. It's nothing quite like dry ground when storms hit. I've had the experience in the surf, on a lake yachting, in the bay kayaking. It's always the same, so relieved to find solid ground in the storm. Over the last few months, as the storm of COVID-19 has descended on the world, I must admit it's felt a little bit unnerving and solid ground seems to have been hard to find. 
our normal go-tos of work and finance, health and sport, connection with family and friends have felt somewhat less than solid over this season. And so last week in the first week of our series, I know this much is true, we talked about where we might find solid ground to build our lives on. It's so good to have you with us for week two in I Know This Much Is True. Uh, If you watched part one of the series last week, you'll know by now that this series is fairly and squarely centred around Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked about the idea of learning from and living out the teachings of Jesus and the radical difference that that can make to our lives. I challenge you to take a look for starters at the Sermon on the Mount and let it mess with your mind a little. I wonder if you've been game to do that this week. And if you have, I wonder whether you're getting a look under the bonnet of who Jesus is in the world and what he can do if we really let him. Can you imagine if our world began to live out the teachings of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount? Imagine what loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you could do in the Middle East. Imagine what loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you could do for our neighbourhoods and our families and our workplaces. Imagine what loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us could do for you in your setting. Imagine if we knew Jesus' words and actually chose to live by them. Imagine what humble generosity and concern for those who are suffering would do to third world poverty. Imagine if worldwide it was the practice of all governments, all businesses and all individuals regularly to give for caring for the needy and the poor and to do it without credit or kudos. Imagine if we knew Jesus' words and chose to live by them. And can you imagine what forgiveness could do if it actually got loose in our lives? Forgiveness in families, forgiveness in friendships, forgiveness in politics and in workplaces. Imagine those hurts and grudges worldwide released and the people who hold those grudges and hurts released with them. Imagine if we knew Jesus' words and actually chose to live by them. So much power in the teachings of Jesus to change lives and transform communities Having said that, the teaching of Jesus without the name of Jesus can soon become distorted and messed up. Without Jesus, generosity and concern for the needy can deteriorate into dogmatic socialism and persecution of the rich. Without Jesus, forgiveness can become a tool for abuse and an open door for abusers. Without Jesus, I venture to add that loving your enemies is not only unlikely in the extreme, If you actually pull it off without Jesus, it's also likely to tee you up for being a doormat. The interesting thing about the teachings of Jesus is that their power is contingent on who you believe Jesus is. It's really interesting that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew tells us that when Jesus had finished saying these things because the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. It's interesting to note that even though the crowds were amazed at Jesus' teachings, it was the authority with which he taught that captured their imaginations. Their observation was that Jesus was not like a mere expert in the law, but something greater was in play here. Something more powerful, more authoritative was at work. It's still true today and many people, no matter what their background, when they read about Jesus and what he said, they're stunned by the truth and the power of his teachings. But dare I say it, if you narrow Jesus down to a mere teacher, albeit a superlative one, you'll have missed his point. It's like owning a Ferrari but never driving it. It's like reading five-star reviews but never giving the thing a go. It's like knowing the instruction manual back to front, but never actually opening the gift and using it. So what's next? How do we go to the next level of understanding and following Jesus' teachings? Maybe for you, 
It's that you don't know Jesus, uh, you know that Jesus' teachings ring true, you know that Jesus' teachings are powerful, but do you know why? How do we go beyond Jesus' words and find his authority? It might interest you to know that Jesus himself didn't believe that he was merely a teacher. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus makes the claim that explain, claims that explain his, theor- his authority. And today we're going to look at some of those claims. Lots of people say lots of things about Jesus, but what did he say about himself? Before we open God's word today, let's pray together that we might experience more than words today and that somehow in the words we might find authority. Let's pray together. God, we come before you today and we ask that you might penetrate all of our predispositions about Jesus and that you might speak to our hearts where we are. I ask that you might speak to each one of us as we watch today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'll never forget my first ride as a passenger on a road bike. The rider I was sitting behind was a very accomplished rider and he was giving me a lift over to Yarram in uh, South Gippsland from the Latrobe Valley. He was a mate of my brother's and had kindly offered to give me a lift on the back of his bike. I don't know what speed we were doing along those roads, but it seemed to be well beyond the recommended speed limit. As we hurtled through the kangaroo infested hills and valleys, every time we went round a corner, we seemed to me to be very close to the ground. And I could hear and feel a sort of a grinding noise when we went round particularly sharp corners. When we stopped, he told me casually that that was the foot pegs dragging. I felt physically ill and I was happy to be off the bike and standing on solid ground. I've never ridden pillion on a road bike since. There's something horribly unnerving about being a passenger when the vehicle feels like it's about to come unstuck. The adrenaline pumps through the system and everything within screams, stop this ride, I want to get off. Whether you're on a bike or in a plane or in a car or on a ride at a carnival or in the middle of a pandemic, when you feel like you're out of control, it can be horribly, horribly unnerving. I think there's a part of Uh, this season that has felt precisely like that for people, a season that is beyond our control, where we're largely passengers and somewhat helpless to change our situation anytime soon. In the Gospel of John, on the night that he's to be betrayed, Jesus tells his disciples something about what's coming their way. And it's not pretty. And then after saying all of that, Jesus finishes off what he's saying with, I've told you these things, so that in me you might have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Prior to this, Jesus had spent nearly a whole chapter outlining how pear-shaped things were about to go, and he finishes with, I've told you these things, so that in me you might have peace. In me you'll have peace. What does that even mean? Well, we're going to have a talk about that in a couple of weeks, but this week, I want to focus on that last bit because it gives us a glimpse of who we are talking to in Jesus. In this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Seems like an odd thing to say for a person who's about to be beaten, whipped and crucified to death by the world around him. But again and again in scripture, Jesus claims authority over all. This isn't the only place that Jesus claims divine authority. We saw it last week in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus places himself in the box seat for the final judgment, where he says to the religious hypocrites, away from me, I never knew you. It might be a surprise to you to know that several times throughout the Gospels, Jesus names himself as one with God. The word for God in the Old Testament is often translated, I am. Yahweh in Hebrew and ego I me in the Septuagint, in the Greek version of the Old Testament. When Moses speaks to God in the burning bush in Exodus 3, in the Old Testament, 
Moses asked God his name. He says, who shall I say is sending me? God says, tell them I am. Yahweh in Hebrew and ego I me in Greek. I am is sending you. I am is a name that God gives himself. And only God can lay claim to his name. In John 8, Jesus is being pursued ruthlessly by the religious elite and they finally ask him where he gets his authority and how he can claim to actually know Abraham. His answer is startlingly forthright and it gets him into trouble. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, ego I me, I am. And in that culture at that time, this is a clear a claim to deity as you can possibly get. And just in case you're wondering whether the religious elite understood his claim, have a look at their response. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. This isn't the only place, though, that Jesus makes such claims. Again and again, Jesus doesn't shy away from his claim to deity. In Matthew 16, Jesus hears the disciples giving their opinions about who the crowd say that he is. Then he asks Peter, what about you, says Jesus? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's a bold claim to deity. How does Jesus respond to such a claim? Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Even in the face of death, Jesus doesn't shy away from his claim. Matthew 4, Mark 14 tells us that in the midst of the priests, the high priest grilling, and even through his, though his life is on the line, Jesus doesn't shy away from his claim to deity. The high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one, God? I am, said Jesus, ego I me, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming in the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard this blasphemy, what do you think? Good part of the reason Jesus was crucified was his claim to being the very son of God. So we're left with the same embarrassing question that faced the disciples and the religious elite. Was Jesus the son of God or was he just a really gifted teacher with some wacky ideas about his identity? Well, C.S. Lewis gives a great answer to this question in his book, Mere Christianity. <coughs> he says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say, says Lewis. The man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd be either a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us and he did not intend to. Now, the single greatest argument against this idea is the assumption that the New Testament is historically accurate and not just a bunch of made-up legends about Jesus. Well, the best indicator here that we're looking at history rather than myth is the level of doubt and dysfunction recorded in the disciples. The very people who claim to follow Jesus run away when he's crucified. It's all very human. And that is not the stuff of legends. And when Jesus is resurrected, none of them believe it until they see it for themselves. Again and again, it's, this does not fit the stuff of legends. The heroes never doubt in legends. The truth of the matter is that embarrassingly, the disciples mock those who do claim 
to see Jesus until he actually shows up in front of them. The most famous account of this is the one about Thomas who says, show me the risen Jesus and let me see the scars and I'll believe in him. Jesus shows up and says, okay, here, Thomas, here you go. And have a look at Thomas's response when Jesus shows up in John 20. He said, then he said to, to Thomas, put your finger here in my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. It took Thomas a while to catch on, but he got there. If you read the passage, you'll notice that Jesus doesn't pull Thomas up or refute this claim because in actual fact, this is the claim that Jesus has made about himself all along. Saul, the guy who spent a goodly part of his life hating and persecuting Christians, finally meets Jesus in a vision on the road to Damascus and goes from hater to promoter. And after the Damascus experience, Saul changes his name to Paul and is sold out for Jesus. And this is what this ex-Christian hater says about Jesus in his letter to the Colossians. He says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything and was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as the thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and holds all creation together. He's talking about Jesus. Paul doesn't just think this either. Ultimately, Paul has his life taken from him because he thinks this, as do the other disciples, from sceptics to full-on followers, from doubters to martyrs. Jesus Christ can turn even the most strident and angry sceptics into a full-on follower. And it's not merely because of his words. It's because of his authority. Look at your phone. Look at your calendar or your watch. Whether you acknowledge it or not, you're living on Jesus' time. AD, Anno Domini, Latin for the year of our Lord. BC, before Christ. Time itself revolves around this figure in history called Jesus Christ. If you want solid foundations for your life, you need look no further. But you need to do more than merely look at his words. To really see his point, you need to accept his authority. Jesus Christ is a solid foundation for your life. He has authority already, but he will never use it to violate your free will. All of us get to choose. But choosing always requires a step of faith. There's a great story in Matthew that we're going to finish on where the disciples are in a boat out on a lake being buffeted by the wind. And Jesus appears to them walking on the water, but because they really don't understand who he is, they're terrified and they actually think that he's, they're seeing a ghost. Take a look at what Jesus said to them in the midst of the storm when they think they're seeing a ghost. Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Those words translated, it is I, are the same words as Jesus used when identifying himself to the religious elite. Ego, I me, I am. Scholars seem to agree that Jesus is gently reminding the disciples of his true identity in the dark of the storm. Take courage. Don't be afraid. I am is here. He still does it, you know. I can't begin to tell you how many times in my life I've been buffeted by the storm and Jesus has shown up and reminded me of his presence and his lordship. The words of Jesus in the dark have been, take courage, I'm here, don't be afraid. Whether I've been drowning in the middle of a lake or been way out of my depth in a work situation, the words of Jesus from out of the dark Take courage. I am is here. Don't be afraid. Whether in crisis driven by relationship or health or even finance, the words of Jesus, take courage. I am is here. Don't be 
afraid. In your situation and mine throughout the world right now, if you truly listen, you can hear him. The words of Jesus still ring out. Take courage. I am is here. Don't be afraid. The story doesn't end here. Peter yells out something from the boat that will change his life. He says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, says Jesus. I've got no idea what Peter was thinking when he yelled this out. But my best guess is that Peter thinks that it's a whole lot safer out on the water with Jesus than it is in the boat without him. For Peter, at least theoretically, Jesus is the equivalent of solid ground. But he had to step out to test it. I'll let you read the rest of the story for yourself, but I've got to tell you that frequently in my life, Jesus has bid me to come, to step out, to take a risk, to defy logic, to trust something other than the things I've built for myself. It seems that faith is always found in facing doubt and stepping out. I don't know where you are and what the challenges and fears that you're facing represent today, but I know this much is true. Jesus is right there with you. And like Peter, all you need to do is step toward him. I don't know whether your challenges and fears are just too hard to face. I don't know whether you're overwhelmed, terrified, or just depressed by what's happening around you right now. But I know this much is true. Jesus is right there with you. And like Peter, all you need to do is step toward him. I don't know whether your storm is emotional, physical or spiritual. I don't know whether it pertains to work or finance or family or to other relationship difficulties. But I know this much is true. Jesus is right there with you. And like Peter, all you need to do is step toward him. I've told this story before, so forgive me if you've heard it. Quite a few years ago, a few mates and I were bungee jumping. One of my really good mates, Sean, was terrified of heights, but he decided that he'd come anyway. It took him ages to climb up the tower. And uh, in fact, all of us had all jumped and come back up to the top again before he actually got to the top. Finally, clinging to the handrail all, for all he's worth, Sean made it all the way to the top. He slowly made his way to the platform and with our encouragement, he allowed the operator to tie him in. He stood up and he shuffled towards the edge and then he took one look and then he shuffled back and he sat down looking pale. He did this a few times and then finally he stood on the edge of the platform while the guy adjusted the rope around his legs. Sean looked out over the vista. The platform was 15 metres higher than the Westgate Bridge, so it was quite a view from where we stood. Eventually, without a word, he put his arms out like a diver and leapt off the platform. As he leapt off the uh, platform, the operator screamed at the top of his voice, Not yet! And then the operator turned around to us, smiled and winked and said, I'm just giving him his money's worth. He'll have a truckload of adrenaline in his, in his system by now. The operator was right. Sean thought that he was all done. He thought he was about to make his, meet his maker. But as the rope took up and he bounced harmlessly up into the air, he yelled, this is awesome. And he kept yelling that until they untied him a few minutes later. It's one thing to believe that the rope will hold you, but it's a whole other thing to jump off the platform. Some of you have heard the teachings of Jesus and even seen others live their lives by them, but have never taken the leap. It's doubt that holds you back. If it is that that holds you back, you're not alone. You're in good company. Peter and the rest of the disciples had plenty of doubt, but still took the leap. Doubt, it seems, is a critical component of faith. It might be that like Peter and company, you need to take the leap Doubts and all. You might be in the category of the people that like Jesus' teaching, but find it difficult to believe in his authority. You don't want to look stupid or be misled. I want to say that you're not alone. The disciples didn't want that either. It might be that like Peter and company, you need to take the leap, doubts and all. 
For some watching this, you will know Jesus' teachings. You'll even know about his authority. But for whatever reason, you've lost faith. Maybe experience, suffering, maybe a storm has caused you to doubt Jesus' words and his authority. You can hear Jesus inviting you to follow him again today. But doubts have replaced faith and it all seems too hard. Well, it might be that like Peter and company, you need to take the leap, doubts and all. And finally, I want to speak to those of you that have known the teaching and power and authority of Jesus in your life, but for whatever reason you are doubting the power and authority or running away from the life that he's called you to. Let me say this just once. There's only one place you will find solid ground. Come back to Jesus and rebuild. Perhaps you feel like you've gone too far and doubt that Jesus can forgive you and restore you. Peter felt that when he met the resurrected Jesus after his devastating denial. But he still took the leap. It might be that like Peter, you need to take the leap. Doubts and all. Why don't we have a crack at doing that right now? Let's pray. Lord God, we bring ourselves before you right now and we acknowledge Jesus as Lord. We acknowledge our doubts, disillusionments and fears right now before you. In your heart right now, just tell Jesus the things that, you're, that are holding you back from moving towards him. Just tell him those things. And so, Lord, even with these obstacles... We call out to you in the dark. We give you thanks that whatever our difficulties or challenges, you are greater than them all. So in your heart, just tell Jesus of your challenges right now. And now in faith, we declare Jesus as Lord over all, including our lives. In your heart, simply say, Jesus, I declare you Lord of all. Lord Jesus, as we take the leap and declare you Lord of all at this time, we ask that you might meet us in the storm, that you might reveal more of yourself to us as we step toward you. And we ask this in your powerful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. It's been good to have you with us as we've talked about Jesus and his authority. And I'd love it in the next few days if you chatted with some friends about what the next step toward Jesus looks like for you and how you're going to take it. Be sure to join us next week when we have a look under the bonnet of Jesus' humanity and see how that can help us in real life. Before I hand back to Ashley on this Mother's Day, let me say some ancient words of blessing over you and yours right now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope that you've been encouraged and felt connected with us. Don't forget to let us know that you are with us via the online check-in. For more opportunities to connect, you can head to the Sindal Baptist Church website. We'd love to have you join with us again next week. Bye till then.